All right, guys, welcome back to the Stop's Bass Podcast, which is my clutch points. I'm your host, Blake Level, with me, as always, my co host, Dylan Reagan, back here to talk about the. Uh, say, usually, like, I've sometimes during these weeks, like before the Super Bowl, Dylan, we're kind of like, well, there's not a lot to talk about outside the game. We're going to do that the week of. So, what's there to discuss? Well, <laughs> there's no shortage of things to discuss right now, um, this time around, because there is a lot happening in the NFL and a lot of significant things that are going on um and let's just dive right in because again there are so many different items to get to here that we haven't talked about since our last episode of the podcast we start with retirement number two for one tom brady and uh he officially announced that we're recording this on wednesday he announced that again on wednesday morning and um so i think this time dylan tom brady is done and uh i think as we saw i think we just kind of you know Maybe expect that last time, but you kind of gave that window of like, eh, you never really know. But now I think it's officially closed um, for Tom Brady. Certainly a disappointing way to go out, I think, just with how the Buck season went. But still, you know, overall, if you're looking at the – and we'll have plenty of time to go into what this means, you know, about the, the legacy yeah. of Tom Brady and all this other stuff because it's pretty well documented at this point. If you've watched the NFL, you kind of know the success he had. But it does have a, a – immediate impact on other places right because it's uh you know the bucks are without their starting quarterback now um and we've also talked about kind of these situations elsewhere um with some of the more prominent uh, i guess openings i guess you could say at the quarterback position we've talked about the raiders a lot um you know we talked about teams like what are the 49ers going to do they seemingly have three quarterbacks that could start somewhere um so it's those kind of things that you know it's a decision that was expected but this can create kind of a, a ripple effect, which of course you also tie in the Aaron Rodgers stuff in Green Bay. Um, so a lot of a lot of interesting dynamics here at play, just given the fact that we knew Brady was going to retire. But if you go a little bit deeper, um, it does have an impact on several teams. Yeah, we were only a few weeks into all the 49er, not even a few weeks, a few days after the with after Purdy's injury, uh, uh, some speculation that he could finally go home to the team he grew up rooting for. All that was fun. The Raiders were obviously a team that throughout the playoffs were kind of, depending on where you look, Jason Luck and Forrest, some people talked about the Raiders as a possible uh, destination. And now, yeah, it makes the move that it does feel a little more final this time. It doesn't hit you as hard as maybe last time because – last time was the first time and now this time you're like yeah. it, it kind of expecting it uh, either this year or next and you already had that initial shock some people kind of joking can we just take the things we wrote about tom brady retiring last year and just like rehash <laughs> just them copy and that, paste. yeah a lot of them don't really change I, I know yeah like you said it was a disappointing season but um you know i don't obviously no one thinks that that's gonna i, I don't think very many people think that tarnishes anything that he did over the course of his career uh you know it would have been maybe a little more fitting for him to almost have led that comeback against the Rams in the playoffs last year. It wasn't meant to be for them, but yeah, this season, so many things went wrong and you know, from Brady's own point of view, it didn't look like he himself was enjoying it as much times where, you know, it was just a frustrating season overall. Uh, maybe some of the things he used to be able to do at times, you know, we weren't seeing quite at the level, just even from the year prior. So, um, it's probably the right time, but it's, uh, affects, you know, now what Tampa Bay does, you think about the residual effect last year, I, I believe Bruce Arians was probably going to, he didn't want to hand off the team to one of his coordinators and, 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 uh, Todd Bowles, uh, in a situation where he felt like it wasn't going to be an optimal, um, going forward with the QB position. Then Brady obviously comes out of retirement. Then as a result, Arians retires and Bowles ends up being the head coach and all the residual effects there. And now on this season, yeah, it kind of, you know, there were as soon as as recently as Tuesday, um, reports from I think Rick Stroud uh, works a, as a Buccaneers beat reporter in Tampa said that many in his family thought that Brady wouldn't retire. So uh, I was kind of, uh, you know, went to bed last night thinking, all right, we're going to hear clutch points be talking about on this podcast, <clears throat> uh, different destinations for him again, kind of rehashing some of the stuff with the 49ers in particular given the Purdy injury, um, some speculation that it could not just be six months, but actually cost him more of next year. Sounds like Trey Lance is going to be healthy enough. But, yeah, there is a, a residual effect that goes down to the Raiders. And obviously now Tampa Bay suddenly is a team that, you yeah. know, when you think about we've talked about the Jets and the Aaron Rodgers connections. We've talked about Derek Carr as a fit possibly there. But now the Bucks, Derek Carr, you know, with the right uh, situation, some of the mm -hmm. weapons they have, um, it's it's just another team that we kind of throw into the mix. I don't think Tampa's gonna 
just kind of overhaul their roster by any means. I don't. I, they're still in a position where too many guys are in the primes of their career. I'd be surprised if they did anything like that. So uh, and there's another contender, uh, another team that's of interest in a really crowded uh, QB carousel. Yeah, I mean, it just it does make things very interesting here because, like we said, is and I think it's like too like we we have the Aaron Rodgers thing sitting out there because that's one that's gonna you know also be in play here in terms of like how this, these dominoes could fall. And, um, yeah. So, I mean, and, and you know, the bucks, as we've said, is just kind of a, I mean, we kind of made the case when Brady ultimately went there. It's like, it's a, it's an attractive option just given some of the pieces that are in play there. And then you do look around at, you know, places like Vegas and, and so forth and really try to figure out how all this is going to play out. But I think right now it's quite a guessing game because I, I, couldn't even begin to predict exactly how this is going to unfold but um yes brady's retirement certainly has an impact on other players as well so it's yep. it becomes interesting right i mean it's just i don't know i'm sure the betting odds will be out there soon who's going to be the next quarterback for the bucks but um i don't know i mean car i think makes sense right like you just i mean that's one that i could certainly see it's just uh there are a lot of moving parts with the niners i think the niners are like the one that hold all the cards here because yeah. it's like they have they have so many different guys, right? And it's just, I don't know. It's like how that whole thing unfolds really kind of perhaps send things in one direction or the other. But there's, um, yeah, there, uh, I mean, there is a, the Niners obviously are on their own as the most attractive destination. Yeah. But at the same time, they're, they're also one of the few teams that has, uh, you know, a player that they gave up a lot of draft capital for in Lance. And even, and if Purdy, you know, even if he does, you know, have to be out for six months, that still would put him, if that's the actual timeline, he'll miss the yeah. offseason program, but he'd be back for the regular season. So they're not in a, as much of a place to like push for sure. But if you're a QB on the market, yeah, that's where you'd like to end up. Um, a team that we're going to talk about soon that just got some draft capital by trading away their coach. Another team in the Saints that I think enter kind of a conversation of you know they're not the least intriguing team by any means obviously the cap is continually an issue uh or or you know a lot of people make jokes that the cap doesn't exist by the way the uh, saints have been able to manipulate it <laughs> but um I, I i've seen some Derek Carr stuff there i mean it's any team that feels like they just need a, a competent quarterback um to win that he kind of gets thrown into the mix with but um you know looking at the market I guess as much as uh, there could be a ton of movement, you know, with things kind of settling down with Lamar, I know we talked about how we felt on an earlier episode that the Ravens should just pay him. It does certainly sound like they're committed to him with him contributing to their uh, decision-making at the offensive coordinator. But uh, yeah, it's, it's should be, it's just so many things are up in the air. It's like, it could be a really calm uh, kind of, uh, carousel um, at the quarterback position it could also go off the rails with a lot of movement so it's a, a lot of things are up in the air but it it's both you know from Brady's point of view it would have been fun obviously just for our, us um, and the and the meet and the content kind of side to be able to talk about Tom on another team and think about what that could mean and think about what the next year but um, it just takes a name out of a already busy uh, amount of movement I mean there's no shortage of teams, even teams like uh, Carolina that who knows what they're going to do a quarterback. Yeah. I mean, there's just a lot of uncertainty. Um, I'd say like almost, you know, it seems like a few teams are going to be drafting quarterbacks. Obviously, the Texans up there, the Colts are considered for that. It sounded like uh, some of the reporting today from, I believe it was Albert Breer about the Bears, sound like they're actually going to stick with Justin Fields, so, um, which is, I think, the right decision, but as we've kind of discussed, but that takes another uh, possible interesting domino out if they were going to consider one of the rookie quarterbacks and what that could have meant um, for Fields, but uh, we'll yeah. see. Hopefully, hopefully we get some movement. I think Aaron Rodgers, like you said, is the big name that's still um, with Brady out. He's now like where you kind of center down to everything might be kind of gets dictated by what happens there, but it looks like, as we've talked about on our previous episode, the NFC is out of that uh, playoff con or, uh, trade conversation. It's only going to be an AFC team that could possibly get Rodgers. I'm looking back last year after Brady retired the first time and the odds for who was going to be the Buccaneers' next quarterback. And Jimmy G had the best odds. Yeah. Um, Kyle Trask was two. Um, Teddy Bridgewater was in the mix. Aaron Rodgers was in the mix. Ryan Tannehill was in there. Um, Nick Foles was in there. So, but Garoppolo was the favorite. So, we'll see if that that plays out. Um, Good. Don't know. Uh, Blaine Gabbert was also in there. I don't, I don't see that. <laughs> but 
Um, yeah, so we'll see what happens there with that. So a lot to talk about moving forward with those QB situations there. All right, speaking of QB situations, um, Russell Wilson hopefully is feeling a little bit better perhaps about the prospects for the the Broncos offense here moving forward because uh, he has a new head coach, and (laughs) Broncos fans are hoping that this could be the difference here uh, to get them on track offensively, and that, of course, is Sean Payton. The trade finalized with the Saints, and, um, you know, this is one that had been kind of in the works when you started to look at the logical landing spots. I feel like we had that conversation when, I don't remember when it was still, and it was a little while back. We were looking at the three different jobs, wasn't it? I think it was Broncos, Colts, Panthers. We were kind of comparing, and we said, look, when now, it's the Broncos. Like, they're the team that's set up, I think, with the best just because of their defense, and, um, you know, there obviously are questions with, with Russ's play and such, but it was just the, the better of the trio um, at the time. You know, we were kind of maybe assuming the Texans were going to be in that group too. And so, yeah, I mean, it just, it made a lot of sense. And if, if Sean Payton was going to get back in the mix, this was just the one that I think was, was the spot. And now, you know, he does get to come in and potentially try to work his magic for a team that, as we know, was just um, so bad offensively, just complete. I mean, one of the all time disappointments, <laughs> I think when you just look at it from a, a season specific like specifically in one season like one of the most disappointing you know units probably we can remember in quite a while um given the expectations for the broncos heading into the season so john payton's there now and i mean dylan i think it's a it's a fantastic hire and um i think you kind of look at it moving forward but at the same time we know the division they're playing in but yeah i mean for the broncos just seemed like a no-brainer yeah, I think from the Broncos' point of view, you know, they they kind of were in the obviously in on Harbaugh, and when that kind of didn't work out, I mean, there's not a lot of you know, there's a lot of you know coordinators out there. You know, think about what Nick Sirianni has done, and, and different guys that aren't the big name hires that end up panning out. But you just don't know. Whereas Sean Payton, you know, there's a lot of yeah, I'm not exactly what Andy Reid's done in Kansas City is amazing getting Patrick Mahomes but you've seen guys that have had successful careers for a long time with one team take kind of a break get fired whatever happens just naturally runs its course and then they go somewhere else like Andy in Kansas City and builds uh, them into this uh, budding dynasty that they have in uh, three Super Bowl appearances in four years that's a not necessarily what's going to probably happen in Denver but I think from the point of view of you know there's maybe some uh, revisionist history or or maybe just in terms of people not at the time being, you know, I was fairly young when the Saints hired Sean Payton, but, um, you know, Drew Brees wasn't exactly like, uh, the, you know, a premier free agent quarterback. Yes. Like looking back, everyone's like, wow, if the Dolphins had signed him, maybe Nick Saban doesn't leave and all this stuff. And the Saints were the one team that took a risk on with the injury history he had in San Diego, but it wasn't like he was like thought of it to be a future hall of fame, you know, setting passing records quarterback that happened under Sean Payton and the tutelage that he what he was able to do not just with that whole roster and that organization but with developing him um and I you know maybe the offense isn't going to look exactly like it did in New Orleans I don't think it should based on some of the things that Russell Wilson does well um but I do believe in Sean Payton knowing his players you, you know look you look at some of those teams at the end of the Sean Payton you know after Breeze retired or when Breeze's arm was and shoulder were compromised they were still putting up great passing numbers they were still finding a way as recently as last season to to put up you know they almost made the playoffs if the Rams had beaten the Niners in week 18 a year ago they would have been the last team in with a you know with Andy Dalton and some of these quarterbacks you know putting up you know EPA wise and uh pass you know looking at their like DVOA passing was t- more towards the middle of the pack with a group you would not have expected that with uh they didn't have a lava yet um so I yeah I think in terms of you know this is a organization with a new ownership that wants to flex its financial muscle that you know there's the reports about sean payton making 17 between 17 and 20 million dollars if you have the money to spend there's no cap on coaching um and at the same time i I, there's you know i've seen some people talk about that's a lot to give up in a trade package wise and i do think from the perspective of the saints you know for a coach that you weren't going to have coach anyway um, to get a first round pick um, and then basically a second round for a third round swap with the, their third rounder, I believe, next year going back to Denver. Um, if you if you're you know, that's great for New Orleans. But from Denver, Denver's point of view, if you get the coach that turns Russell Wilson's career around after you made that tra- trade and how disastrous of a season it was. And even if it doesn't after this next year, that it would be 
horrible the dead cap situation i have to look at uh, spot track to get the exact uh numbers but um they could move on and still have him as the as the as the head coach with a, a defense that's in a you know still in a pretty good position i don't know um if they're gonna be able to to keep a Jero as their defense coordinator kind of awkward with how everything went down with Hackett and him being a good friend of his and we'll see I think he'll end up on his feet somewhere else but I, I still believe in what the, the you know the talent that they do have on the defense how good they were this past year depending on who they can get in um yeah I I think this is worth the payment knowing that you have this proven guy that is a not you know great at developing quarterbacks that understands how to put his players in the situations to utilize their own talents he's had a year off uh, watching the the game you know NFL did have kind of a you know off or passing offense wasn't you know quite as efficient at times this season as it has been in past years with the way that defense has evolved and just some things of the defensive lines and overall the, the schematics that we've seen over the last few years with teams moving to too high and kind of just putting the shell on the top of the defense and forcing you to work underneath um it's uh, it's made things a little more complicated but i you know i out of all the people <laughs> in terms of you know outside of like Kyle Shanahan and um, some of these uh, great offensive minds that are still in the NFL, Andy Reid. I mean, I Sean Payton's got to be up there underneath that group um, in terms of who you'd like to have. So I think the Broncos absolutely found the right guy. Um, and, you know, as much as it, there was kind of people making fun of the – or questioning, I should say, maybe not making fun of their whole process because it seemed to be like they, they kept going back to Harbaugh. Then we'll get yeah. to the stuff about the <laughs> – Miko Ryan's situation and the disagreements about how that all went down but it seemed like you know no matter and this is something that Mike Sando uh, was talking about in one of his recent pieces but it is it was whatever happens with that process the end result is what people are going to really remember in a, a year from now two years from now if Denver's at least competent on with Russell Wilson and things aren't so bad and maybe they get into the playoffs no one's going to remember how that process seemed the co- their, their coaching search seems so disjointed they're just going to remember that they got Sean Payton and that it worked out yeah I mean I you're right I mean that's kind of what because you know what the goal is like when you you make this hire like it's very clear what the goal is for the Broncos, and as we said, I mean, having the defense they have in place, and um, they've got pieces. It's just <laughs> last year, which is, I mean, this past season was just so uh, disappointing. It doesn't even properly describe it. Like, it was just almost shocking at times just how bad they were offensively. And, um, again, you have someone like this come in and has, you know, certainly I think hiring the right staff around him is, is important. And, um, yeah, it's it's going to be interesting to see because, again, we talked about the division too, and, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens in Denver, but I, I think that was a, a no brainer for the Broncos and uh, for Sean Payton, I think it was the best choice of the group. Yeah, uh, for sure. So, all right. Now, speaking of that Broncos, you said could have had some other people in mind and we know some of those people, but, um, one of them apparently was D'Amico Ryan's depending on who you believe in terms of the, the timing of uh, their interest in D'Amico Ryan's, who is now the new head coach for the Texans, which I thought just kind of, you know, it just, it fits, right? I think when you're talking about the Texans and what they want to achieve moving forward, you hire someone like this, you're basically starting from scratch if you're the Texans. I mean, you're really just kind of trying to build from the ground up. And I think defensively, we talked about it, right? You think back to those Texans teams that were making the playoffs every year. What was that based around? A lot of that was based around a good defense and a yeah. defense that was at the top level in the NFL. And just haven't had that. Now, of course, the offense hasn't exactly been great either, but if you can start from the defensive standpoint, they've got some pieces. We've talked about that too. They've drafted some young players on the defensive side. But, I mean, D'Amico Ryans, what he accomplished with the Niners, um, you know, all that stuff. But the more fascinating thing, Dylan, of course, is kind of the the reporting on the D'Amico Ryans Broncos um, love affair here, if you will. Um, and, you know, for starters, and I told you before we started recording, <laughs> It's like I had to do a double take because, you know, you have notifications on for Schefter and Rappaport and, you know, they both kind of whatever that they send out stuff back to back. And so I look at one, I'm like, okay. And then I look at the other, I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> like, because usually, right, it's, it's they're saying the same thing. They're just saying it a different way. Uh, but this one, you looked at it and I'm like, hold on. They are saying the exact opposite, actually, um, of what happened here. So who am I to believe here? as to what the situation was, and we'll just read them. So Schefter tweets that the timing of today's two hires was completely coincidental. Broncos were zeroed in on Sean Payton, didn't make any contact this week with D'Amico Ryans or his agent. Denver was focused on Payton and Houston on Ryans. Okay, so there we've established 
that this week, the focus for the Broncos was all Sean Payton. Focus for the Texans was all D'Amico Ryans. All right? So that's that's number one. Now, if you go the other direction here, and we go to Ian Rappaport, unbelievable. <laughs> the Broncos spent today. Remember, these tweets are, hold on. These tweets are 13 minutes apart. Actually, Rappaport's tweet Rappaport's was first. first yeah. yeah, Rappaport was first. Schefter follows up. Okay, so I, I read them in the reverse order. But keep in mind, that was Schefter's response to this tweet from Rappaport. Unbelievable. The Broncos spent today trying to hire D'Amico Ryans again, all caps, again, today, before he recommitted to the Texans, sources say. When he agreed to terms with the Texans, they moved, they being the Broncos, and finalized Sean Payton. So, a very interesting um, situation there, Dylan, but ultimately, I think both parties wind up in the spots they want to wind up in. I I thought this would be the, the way it would go anyways, but it's kind of interesting to think about. <laughs> Apparently, either, either the Broncos spent all day um, on, what, Tuesday, trying to hire D'Amico Ryans before it was unsuccessful after he chose the Texans, and then they went to Sean Payton, or the Broncos had been zeroed in on um, Sean Payton for, you know, a week or so now, and there was no communication. So the truth perhaps lies somewhere in the middle, but it is it's very unusual when we get those conflicting reports from those two guys. Based on the timing of the Rappaport's tweet first and the uh, Schefter's <laughs> tweet afterward, my at least our instant takeaway was Denver's trying to some damage agents control aren't this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> some people are not pleased with this and they're trying to kind of cover their tracks. Uh, Rapport went even further. Yeah, he followed up that exact tweet by saying the last few weeks that they Denver had initially zeroed in on D'Amico Ryans. Uh, we haven't talked too much about how they, you know, there's the whole thing with Jim Harbaugh, right? Like we talked yeah. about it initially as a candidate, but then they, after there was the tweet from Michigan and everything about Jim staying, they went and tried to get him again um and there are some uh, this is again from mike sando has a lot of great connections on this kind of coaching stuff he was talking about this on the athletic uh, nfl podcast on monday so before the hiring happened about how his take on it and his take from some of the sources between these teams is that D'Amico Ryan's may have chosen denver but there was some you know confusion over the fact uh, it kind of leaked out that Denver behind uh, their owner or whoever it was went to try to lure Jim Harbaugh from Michigan again after kind of talking to D'Amico at that point it's uh, Ryan's you know uh, this is at least uh, what those sources kind of were saying that kind of felt better about the whole situation with Houston and unlike a lot of guys that you know don't have two choices necessarily D'Amico was kind of able to go at the place which you know as he's talked about he's you know you know, effectively has made Houston his home previously and yeah. wants to be as part of an organization that, you know, with all the draft capital they have. And, uh, you know, it just seemed like a better fit. But regardless, maybe Denver did screw up their chance of getting D'Amico. They might have had a chance if they just went straight for him instead of kind of keeping these Sean Payton and Jim Harbaugh uh, situations going on as uh, in, in the back burner. But it worked out, I think, for both sides by the end of it. I think D'Amico still would have been a fantastic hire. Um, I think Sean Payton, from his point of view, though, I don't know if he would have – I don't think he would have gone to Houston or um, Arizona kind of seemed to, like, fall off as a destination and Indianapolis never came together at all. So he might have had another year off um, at the rate it was going. Maybe something opens up next year. Maybe, you know, the residual effects of Denver doing this, it's crazy how it all worked out. Maybe D'Amico would have chosen Houston anyway. But uh, it, it feels like, you know, Rappaport has not – it's not like he, like, backtracked any of this. He, he's kind of, like, doubled down – <laughs> essentially i i feel like this is and he has uh ben albright's a reporter in denver kind of saying the same kind of basically confirming from his own sources is, is kind of what he has felt was going on as well in denver so uh yeah interesting strategy but again um at the end of the day they got sean payton yes they ended up having to give up draft capital they wouldn't have for D'Amico ryan's but uh if if things work out there then no one's gonna look at this as no one's gonna care about how messy it kind of was to to occur they're just gonna think at the end of the day the process worked out because they got sean payton uh but for D'Amico ryan's yeah it, it, you know I, i'm hopeful from his for his sake you know that this is unlike some of the last couple of hires with coley and lovey smith that Houston is going to actually give the coach a chance to to build something. I I think that maybe they hopefully have the have been able to reflect and know that they're a little bit further along, but they're still in the middle of a, you know very much in the middle of a rebuild. They still have a yeah. lot of pieces to work on. They've they got some good defensive talent um, in the last draft, but they have a lot more 
a lot of holes still to pick up. I think, you know, having, I was trying to look up while we were talking here, their uh, draft capital, but I think they have a couple first round picks this year, if I'm not mistaken, and maybe even two next year. So, um, I mean, between all the picks that they do have, I, I think that they are in a place where, yeah, they, um, it, with the, the right coaching on defense as they get some of these talented guys in, I think the culture they're going to be able to build there with D'Amico will be a lot of fun. It's definitely, it, it, after being a team that we've kind of not really paid a ton of attention to the last few years, I think with a, assuming they get a rookie quarterback, if it's Stroud, if it's Young, um, most likely one of those two, I'd guess, um, regardless of who it is. I think you're going to be really intrigued by this team uh, more so than we have been in years, more so than, you know, since the, I think it was uh, 2019 when they were up 24 zero or whatever it was in the chiefs and blew that lead in the divisional round. That's the, you know, it's, it, it really isn't that long ago. It feels like it's much longer ago that Houston was relevant and there still might not be relevant quite yet, but I I do hope from, uh, you know, compared to the last couple of coaches that with D'Amico, they're, not going to have another you know if they go five and 12 next year i don't think they're going to be firing him the same way they might have with levy if that was their record this year i think it's uh this is a guy that they're going to kind of give at least two three you'd hope at least three um but at least two i'd guess uh years to um kind of start to turn things around and get the culture in the right direction and with the right quarterback Things could change. You know, this division, as much as we're all high on um, the Jags and what Trevor Lawrence did this past season, it's not like the division that I think that you're looking at Sean Payton going to with the Chiefs machine and um, what the Chargers could be. Uh, excited to see what they do with Kellen Moore, another you know, uh, yeah. higher the kind of thing that we kind of slipped through and happened so fast that I am intrigued to see what he can do there. So the division-wise between these two coaches, um, I, I, it's hard to argue that um sean payton has a an easier path i think d'amico while the roster isn't in the as good of a place as denver's necessarily they have the financial flexibility with the cap um they have a lot of draft capital uh, things that denver doesn't necessarily have going in their way as well as a division that's not nearly as uh, as striking a, as one that they could be conquered in the afc south yeah i think the the texans are done with a one-year uh, plan i think this Hope is, so. <laughs> if, you, if you make this higher you have to be willing to invest long term. I think that's what they're doing here. And um like I said, I think him building the foundation of the defense with the possibility that they're gonna get, you know, a potential franchise quarterback in the draft, um, that's kind of an exciting thing. So I think that combination could work well for the Texans in a division, as we said, that almost every year feels like it's kind of up in the air. Um and you really don't know what to expect from it. So we'll see what happens there um with D'Amico Ryan's the Texans head coach, not the Broncos head coach, but perhaps could have been, depending on who you believe. Uh, there. All right. One more thing here, Dylan. We didn't really talk about the Frank Reich hiring again. That kind of all happened, you know, with everything going on with the championship games and such. And um, we didn't really talk about that one because I think that was another one that sort of just came, you know, kind yeah. of came out of nowhere. Um, we didn't really know where the the Panthers were going to turn. Um, I mean, it's an interesting hire, I guess, because, you know, I mean, I feel like the Colts were not that far away, right? And we kind of talked about that before and had some injuries and certainly a quarterback situation and all this stuff where it just feels like, I don't know, things change very quickly for the franchise. And, and I don't know that Frank Wright was the full reason behind that, um, you know, and, and I think if you look at it that way, he's someone that, look, the Panthers were not going to be one of the most attractive options on the board. Let's just, let's call it what it is. Like, they were not going to be... I mean, again, if we ranked them, right, I think we had the Panthers last of, the, last of those three teams. Um, and then, of course, who else am I forgetting? The Texans have became official. The Cardinals. The Colts, um, yeah. Colts, Broncos, Panthers, Cardinals, yeah, just the, Texans. Just the five. Just the five, is that right? Yeah. So I think of that group, and you can, you know, I guess we can argue a little bit. I, I think this was probably the, the least attractive job of the group, uh, maybe besides the Texans, although I think that, the Texans from a, I don't know, I, I, I guess you could debate those two. Um, but I don't know what to think about this because to me, this like this feels like the hire that gets you to the hire, if that makes sense. Like this is the hire where maybe he can just come in and just kind of get you to a respectable spot and then maybe go out, you know, whatever, three years and make a big splash and all of a sudden, you know, the job becomes more attractive. But I don't think as of right now, this was a very attractive job. And – I'm not saying, you know, that, that Frank Wright can only get jobs that are not attractive. It's just, I think, just kind of given where 
things were. And, you know, he did get to the playoffs a couple times with the Colts. Um, and really, you know, I don't think ever really just kind of bottomed out with the Colts, right? They just maybe didn't achieve the success they wanted to achieve. And, yeah. uh, I mean, you know, I think this is kind of, for me, it's, it's a hire that's fine. But, you know, to say that you're overly excited or overly disappointed, probably not. But I don't really know what the Panthers should have been expecting right now, honestly. Yeah, I, you know, I think Frank Reich, <clears throat> whether it was going to be this year or some point in the near future, deserved another shot. You, you think about what that team, the direction it was moving before Andrew Luck retires and what could have been and how good they still were at times with Phillip Rivers. They lost a lot of <clears throat> close games that season. Um, yeah. And then the last couple of years, just taking, you know, just it, it shows and it's something that Carolina's struggled to do since Cam Newton's best days is finding that quarterback. Um to, to lead your your team it, it's really hard unless you have a ridiculous roster it you know I don't think the blueprint of what the Niners and you know I think there are signs that Purdy's uh, pretty dang good for the last pick of the draft um, but and but at the same time I mean there's only so many teams that could you know have a seventh round pick come in and still keep winning the way the Niners did they've built a ridiculous roster and I don't think you know the Colts as much as they at times it was like wow they got this great offensive line they have some interesting defensive pizzas they didn't even finish that terribly on defense this past season I don't think um DVOA wise at 14th right in the middle of the ra- uh middle of the road um but they're just still without a quarterback it it's it really takes away a lot and their offensive line was starting to kind of go downhill I think that, you know Carolina at least we saw over the course of the season they they battled they didn't yeah. they didn't kind of bottom out uh, they were still, you know, things could have gone differently. They could have won the division. Uh, they had the that lead on the Bucks late in the season where they could have swept the season series and had the tiebreaker. wasn't meant to be, but, you know, I, I think they have some interesting pieces. I think, you know, potentially you would have liked to have made some of the – I think the Rams offered like two future first-round picks for Brian Burns, and you think about where this team is, and maybe Brian will be part of uh, some better days for Carolina – uh, before his career is over uh, he's still relatively um, young but uh, I think if you look back and look at where that you'd feel about what them if they had that draft capital and moving the same direction not necessarily like the Lions but like a team that has the draft capital and you're like maybe we'll get a bridge quarterback then we make ourselves a better roster we figure some things out we get the culture going maybe this can actually work out so for, for Frank's point of view yeah it, it I, I'm happy for him that he was able to get another opportunity quickly after you know things just kind of not necessarily completely his fault, obviously, um, with how it fell apart there um, with the with the Colts. But uh, I think he had, you know, he's still obviously respected, still did some really good things with the Colts. Obviously, a big part of the Philadelphia, the last Super Bowl run for that franchise as their offensive coordinator. So, um, I, yeah, you know, I've, I I looked at the the position here, didn't have I think because of similar to when we talk about the the Colts and Texans in the AFC South. The NFC South isn't exactly the most uh, dangerous division right now with where Tampa's yeah. go- going, obviously Brady retiring now, uh, where, where are the Saints going to be, where are the Falcons going to be. I mean, it's not necessarily a division that has uh, a ton of uh, the, the largest mountain to climb to get your franchise back into the playoffs. So from that point of view, maybe things can work out i you know i wish they had a little bit better draft pick if they were in that colts number four spot maybe i'd feel good about their chances of trading up to get a, to a bryce younger a cj stroud um at, you know sitting back i believe they're at ninth right it i you know there are some options there uh, depending on we'll see how far levis falls I, you know some mocks have yeah. him going in the top five at this point so it gets to an interesting place with them at the quarterback position. Um, their GM fitter said so they're not afraid to take a shot at um, drafting a quarterback, but you know they have drafted a number of QBs. He's only been there since I think yeah, last 2021 was his first season as the GM after almost two decades in the Seattle organization. So I, you know, what Tepper's done with the structure of you know hiring fitter and now with Reich. I mean they're. These are these are guys that you're like taking. I think unlike what happened with Matt Rule, I think you you feel a little bit better about the kind of culture that Reich's going to be able to cultivate. How the players are going to respond to him. It's just a matter of if you can get the right players in place. Um, hopefully they give him some leeway. But yeah, it's a it's a hire that doesn't have. It's not like with D'Amico and like the fact that we know they're likely going to get that new franchise QB. You're excited about what maybe Houston can do, and even if they don't make the playoffs, it could be a fun season. You're 
obviously the storyline of Sean Payton and, and Russell Wilson, as we just talked about, is going to be something that dominates headlines throughout the offseason, all next season, running it back. It's no, you know, all the all the Russell Wilson hype last year. It's going to be kind of revamped and a little different. But uh, yeah, between the all three of these jobs, this one is the undercard just by default. Um, but yeah. I still think it could end up working out. It's not like you said. It's not like a hire that's like, whoa, this is crazy. But at the same time. Uh, I feel like they could have done much worse than getting a uh, coach of Frank Reich's uh, stature. So it'll be an interesting uh, still team. I don't think there's, you know, I think when we talked about it last time, I I was putting it because I, I just, they still have some level of flexibility. Um, I didn't think this is like the worst job necessarily available. I think Arizona seems like from my point of view yeah, th- to be maybe. the worst one yeah. um, of the bunch. But I don't know if the Panthers are like they have some interesting pieces. They've hit on some draft picks. I would I, I wish for, you know I'm happy that um, for the from the Bears' point of view, excited what Justin Fields can do. It would have been you know interesting to have seen if Carolina had drafted uh, Justin Fields instead of J.C. Horn. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, now you got to run it back. Maybe you know Fields got fell to that kind of area of the of the first round. Maybe they'll uh, not have to to wait too long to get their franchise quarterback you never know when you can hit on a guy but i think just figuring out the the system they want to do um figuring out some of the pieces along the offensive line to, to kind of get that in a, a little better place it started playing some pretty good football at times over the course of the year they were running the ball uh, really well there for a few weeks um when it, they didn't really have much option to do a much else so i think there's i don't know if they're like just because i think it's the division they're in maybe I, I'm, I'm less like worried about like their long-term future um than maybe i was like going into the season when i think we at one point talked about like the the state the status of the panthers and the falcons and we were talking about how we we maybe were a little more optimistic about atlanta's ability to kind of turn things around um on a quicker timeline with some of the pieces they had i I i'm not as worried about the panthers as i may have been um just even before this past season i think that they did some good things i think moving on from matt rule is probably the right decision um with how what was going on there um you know you could have made an argument that steve wilkes deserved uh, more uh, run time to, to really have a full season as the head coach with some of the good things he did in, as the interim. But uh, we'll see how Frank Reich does. I, I, it'll be an interesting team still, in my opinion, to, to follow and an off season that's going to be really important for them to take that next step. And maybe by 2024, we're looking at them as a team that expects to be in the playoff conversation. I guess finally, like where do the Cardinals go? Like what's, <laughs> I guess that's the question. Like as we wrap up here, like it's, Colts too, I mean, I, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, Colts too. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just curious about because you, I mean, based on what you just said, like you said, if you if you're ranking the jobs, and I think you make the argument for the Cardinals or the Panthers, but you know, let's say the Cardinals are at that bottom, at the bottom there of this this tier. Um, yeah, like it's 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 an interesting question, kind of where they go. I mean, I know they've interviewed several people, um, or, or these guys who have lined up for interviews. Um, Mike Kafka's one, I know Brian Callahan, those both offensive coordinators, Giants and Bengals respectively. Um, Lou Anarumo's one, of course, a defensive coordinator for the Bengals. I mean, Vance Joseph, I know was kind of in the mix, I suppose. Yeah. Brian Flores. Brian Flores. I mean, look, you, if you listen to our podcast over the years, I, I think this would be a no brainer for me as to who I would hire, but, yep. um, I think Brian Flores is probably the best remaining option for the Cardinals or the Colts perhaps maybe um it's gonna be interesting to see where like I said where the Cardinals go and of course you can throw the Colts in there but Cardinals are just such an an interesting spot like (laughs) because yeah like there's not I don't know like they're the upside maybe just isn't isn't there that you would think could be there if you just look at the team on paper but I I don't know what that looks like for them so yeah i see say at least in tr- or maybe the bottom of the jobs not as an over i'm not trying to overly slide the cardinals and it's definitely not a slide at kyler i think he is the one yeah. part of this team that makes me feel like if i'm a if i'm a coach i'm like all right I, I, you know some people don't believe in him i think he can be really good i think some of the things they did schematically at times were limited with you know there's, there's a common criticism of cliff kingsbury not varying his uh approach and his system and kind of just sticking to it and not making adjustments as seasons went on. The, the Cardinals tended to have good starts to seasons. Uh, obviously, last year was a, a different uh, case overall, but they s- tended to have pretty good starts of the years. Things would kind of tail off as teams adjusted to what they were doing. And 
I think the bigger, you know, indictment of what happened there is some of the drafting on defense, you know, some of the things they did with, you know, people kind of clowning them for how they were trying to make Hassan Reddick an off-ball linebacker, and now we're seeing him just dominate off the edge for Philadelphia. Um, They drafted guys with just a positionless kind of mentality without really a plan at times on defense. It it just they ended up with a team that drafted a lot of interesting players, but without much cohesion to the to the whole unit. Um, the offensive line has tons of question marks. Hopkins probably possibly getting traded. I it's just a, a roster outside of the quarterback position. I have I have some uh, concerns for, and I, I just think that you know Kyler could be there for the long term, but as a coach, you might only get a couple years, and if things don't work out well, they might just move on to the next guy. So that's my concern that you could be turning this team around. And still, still be canned based on where they're going to be heading uh, over the next few years. So, I think um, in terms of yeah, like you said, Brian Flores for me, I think Anarumo and what he's able to do as a you know possibly one of the better defensive coordinator game planners in the in the league, and how he's able to make in game adjustments as we've seen over the last few years in Cincinnati, obviously as a talented defense. Um, those are two guys that I would be really curious about them bringing in you know for stability for Kyler. Yes, you could look at Brian Callahan or some of the – and Kafka and that go that kind of offensive mind route. But in the right system, I mean, it's still – I think, you know, there's a lot of head coaching jobs uh, and coaches that aren't going to be like what's happening in New York with the Giants and with Philadelphia where the offensive coordinator is still able to call plays. A lot of places you're not going to be able to call plays as an OC. So it's still an attractive place if, say, they get one of those defensive uh, minds to be their head coach to come in and be, uh, be the play caller. Um so it's an interesting decision. It feels like maybe they're going defense because we see this with teams that like to yeah. kind of fluctuate when they ha- have something bad happen with an offensive coach or a defensive Go coach. The they opposite. like to completely flip yeah. the other way, right? <laughs> um, so maybe it feels like that's going to be the case. I think at Flores, in terms of just getting the most out of a roster um, and being able to to take what yeah. they are going to have, I would, I, like you said, in a heartbeat, I would I would pick him potentially. I think Lou, though, from the Bengals, D.C., and Arumo. Also, I think those are the two that I would, uh, I'm would. i the most intrigued by um, as a possible fits. Maybe for Lou, I, from his point of view, I don't know if that's the best. Again, that's yeah. the one where I'm maybe concerned about him getting the short end of the stick, not having the players to make the, you know, to, to kind of quickly get that defense right on track. Um, or as I think Flora, yeah, it's just a different kind of case. I think for Flores is the one that I would love to see it, um, but we'll find out. It's just a roster that needs a lot of work with a lot of a lot of questions, not a lot of anything to to help. To it's just it's going to be. I think unfortunately for their for their case, it's going to be a second before they're back into uh, into contention, especially in this division. I don't think the Niners are going away for any period of time, no matter who's there at quarterback, Seattle already on the right track, even if he'll say, it sounds like Gino will be back, but, um, and the Rams, who knows what they're going to be like next season, but, uh, it's not the easiest division and it's a, just a, at least the Colts have some pieces. I, you know, it's, I know the quarterback is the most important position to have figured out. Um, and you'd have to be probably confident that, uh, whoever comes in is happy with, uh, Kyler and believes that he is the guy to lead them. I think a lot of these coaches would believe that, um, but it's still tough if you don't have so many other things going right for you. And I, I just do have concerns about the rest of the construction of this roster. It might be a few years until they're back in it. I think Callahan makes sense for the Colts, knowing they're probably going to draft a quarterback. Um, I think yeah. Flores makes sense for the Cardinals. I just I think those are the two there. Um, I don't know. That that would be my, my bet right now if I had to make a bet. I think those are the, the ones that make the most sense, but we'll see. I like what Callahan for the Colts. That's a good one for sure. I mean, and Especially right, with I the mean, young quarterback that they could get, yeah, right? I just think that's – I think that makes the most sense. So um, we'll see if that's how it turns out. But, yeah, I, I like that option. The Colts, and like I said, I, I think Flores – I I don't think Flores would be a good fit with the Colts because I think I could see him in um, – What's his name? Why am I Jim forgetting Mercy. his name? Jim Mercy. I can see them butting heads. Um, so could be interesting. I've yeah. heard, seen a uh, Raheem Morris is another name with the Colts. That he's interviewed twice. Um, obviously, I don't know, see why. Based, you know, if his if he was a really hot prospect after as a coaching head coaching prospect after the Rams won the Super Bowl, I don't know if things would have necessarily changed after just one year. He's still the same guy. Um, yeah. So he's maybe in the mix. I know he's a name that's been mentioned, but. I agree that like Callahan and, and then Steichen from 
uh, the Eagles are kind of the two that maybe I've seen the most interest in. But I think that yeah. Callahan, like you said, that seems to fit. And they're a team that, you know, we haven't t- didn't talk about them as much here, but I'm sure we will once they hire a new coach. They're uh, with that number four pick. They have as good of a chance as anyone to get along with Houston, one of those top two quarterbacks. So yeah. um, you, you take that into account. You want a, probably an a offensive mind to be the, the guy that's getting their career off the, off the ground. Yeah. We will see what happens, but it's lots of interesting coaching moves, more to come, as we said. And, oh, yeah, there's a Super Bowl to be played, too, uh, in case you forgot about that. That'll take place next week, and we will use uh, all of next week, uh, both episodes, kind of dive into the Super Bowl, as we always do. But for now, Dylan, lots of stuff over Clutch Points, reacting to these hires, looking ahead uh, to the Super Bowl, all kinds of stuff, so let everybody know we can find all of that. Yeah, you can go to clutchpoints.com in the NFL section. We have yeah, tons of fallout from the NFC and AFC title games. Still still a lot of still trash talk that's kind of uh, rever- reverberating between the Chiefs and the Bengals. Um, got all that covered. All this coaching news, obviously. Um, tons of stuff happening with coordinator jobs, like we mentioned with Kellen Moore with the Cowboys, with the, the head coaching jobs filled. We've gone over some of the uh, – QB carousel stuff, some of the best trade destinations for these quarterbacks, destinations for guys like Derek Carr and Rodgers. Everything's covered NFL-wise in the NFL section of Clutch Points and in the NFL section of our Clutch Points app. You can follow the Super Bowl in there, obviously all news, everything you want to uh, follow in the meantime there as well. So yeah, it should be fun. Got the Pro Bowl events coming up starting by the time you're listening to this. It'll be that day, I think. Some of the stuff is Thursday night. I'm curious to see how it goes. It uh, it is kind of striking. We, this might have to be something we talk about at a separate time. The fact that Tyler Huntley threw two touchdowns and he's on the in the Pro Bowl, it's uh, it's interesting. <laughs> I I was thinking about this. I think I stopped caring about the Pro Bowl in like '98 or so, 2000 <laughs> or something. Like I I don't even like this isn't even on my radar. On the punter, that's like the last time that like, it was. This is like I feel like I remember like back in the day. Was it? Is that like the the quarterback club or what was it like? They do the like the quarterback throwing target yeah, competition, that was fun. like Marino and um, Favre and all those guys are in there doing that. Like I, it shows my age, but it's like that was more exciting to me than anything. Like I, the Pro Bowl, I'm I have no no feelings about it whatsoever. So like, hey, it, yeah, I'm sure it'll be fun, but I'm just like, it's it's an exhibition, and again, it's it's entertainment at this point, and um, yeah, we'll see what happens. I, I'm looking forward to just seeing. If it's if it's fun, like that's all that matters at this point. So doesn't mean anything, uh, but yeah, we'll we'll see what happens there. So check everything out there at Clutch Points. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast. You can do that to any podcast app you use. Search for Establish the Pass. And uh, thanks as always for listening to the podcast. And we'll talk to you next time here on the Establish the Pass podcast.